The year is 1713, and a big idea is about to hit a small time crook called Jonathan Wilde. A close look at the law has shown him that whilst receiving stolen goods was a crime punishable by death, returning them to their rightful owners so long as no one could prove you knew who nicked them was not. Of course. <laughs> You're a clever boy, Johnny. Jonathan's big idea worked like this. A thief would give Jonathan information about something they'd stolen. Would you go for me then? I won't touch it, if you don't mind. Where'd you get it? An old lady. On the Strand. Last Thursday after me. I'll be in touch. Jonathan would then approach the owner, claiming that he knew it had been sold to a pawnbroker of his acquaintance and, for a fee, he could get it back for them. What's it supposed to be? I don't know. I can get you a dozen. It was whilst engaged in this business that Wilde was first visited by the law, a man called Charles Hitchin. I haven't been here before. Charles Hitchin held the title of Deputy Undermarshal of London. Interesting little office, if I may say so. Very enterprising, very uh, organised. Yes. Back then, London had no police force to speak of. The first line of defence were constables appointed by the judiciary in much the same way than a jury is today. Imagine that, you get a letter and you're told that you've got to be a policeman for the next year. And worse still is they only had limited powers of arrest in the few streets that they were appointed to watch. Far more effective were the two city marshals. That's right, just two. The upper marshal and the under marshal. They at least got paid and could arrest people anywhere in the city. Charles Hitchin was the under-marshal, and one would have thought a visit from him would have young Jonathan quaking in his boots. But that's where you'd be wrong. You see, like the jailers in the Compter, Charles Hitchin paid for his job, £700 a year, to be precise. Now, given that the salary was £200 a year, plus sixpence for every criminal court, Charles Hitchin would have to arrest 20,000 criminals a year just to break even. So it's fair to say that Hitchin was keen to make money from his title in other ways, which is why he hadn't come to arrest Jonathan. Oh, I'd like to offer you the job as my assistant. Well, I don't want to rush into something I might regret later. Oh, there's, there's no hurry. <laughs> I suppose this would mean me giving up my uh, prison situation. Necessarily, Mr Wilde, no. It turns out that Hitchin's real source of income was the same as Wilde's, returning for a fee stolen property. But he had the advantage of a big stick with which to force thieves to trade with him. Accept my price for your stolen goods or accept my ticket to the noose. Well, Mr Hitchin, as we say in Wolverhampton, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Quite so, Mr Wilde. Quite so. <laughs> From the moment that Jonathan Wilde teamed up with Charles Hitchin, his criminal empire expanded dramatically, with Wilde soon calling himself the thief-taker-general of Britain and Ireland. Would you mind them, Hitchin? And what a general he was. Taking a thief usually meant a fight, and Jonathan had lots. Good job, Vizaya! He's torn for you! <laughs> As a result of this hands-on approach to his new job, by the time he was hanged, he had two silver plates over fractures in his skull and 17 other wounds from swords, daggers and gunshots. From that moment on, Jonathan became the godfather of the London underworld. No crime happened without him knowing about it, and if any criminal disobeyed him, then they would end up being worse off than their victims. This is a man who sent 67 of his former criminal associates to the gallows, not out of spite or revenge or even to save his own skin. No. As Marlon Brando said in The Godfather, This is nothing personal. It's just taking care of business. The system worked perfectly, Jonathan making money from the criminals either directly from their crimes or from the rewards he got from sending them to the gallows. 
Anyone who'd had property stolen or been mugged in the street or robbed on the highway came straight to Jonathan Wilde first. Somehow, he'd always managed to locate the items within a day or two, which is hardly surprising, seeing as he probably organised the theft in the first place. I'm getting fed up with it. What do you think he's doing in there? Well, now, Mr... Um... Oh! Your Lordship, may I say what a great pleasure and honour it is to make your acquaintance, I'm sure. Don't mention it to anyone. Right. Now, it's about a gold watch and chain, I see. Yes. It's a, it's a family heirloom. It has great sentimental value. Well, it was given to me by my late father, the 14th Earl of Westmoreland. Must be worth a bob or two, then. My dear fellow, it's absolutely priceless. How oh, good. Ellie, if you be so kind. I won't handle it if you don't mind, your lordship. Stalin property, see? Wouldn't be right for a man in my position. No, quite. Now, upon the delicate matter of a fee... With the carrot of money and the stick of the noose, it seemed that everything stolen in London ended up passing across Wilde's desk. What's it got here, boy? A very nice find. Indeed, he soon had so much loot on his hands that he bought a boat with a full-time crew to shift anything which he could not get back to his rifle owners out to Holland on a weekly basis. Good morning, Mr Wilde. Wilde was at the peak of his powers. The government even came to him for advice on how to deal with the rising crime rate. His answer was that they should raise the reward money. And why not? You see, Jonathan was a pig with his snout in both ends of the trough. He was either making money from the villains by trading in their goods or making money from the government by trading in the villains. A hike in the reward money meant a hike in Jonathan's bank balance. Throughout his life, Jonathan kept a detailed record of every crime committed by the thieves he dealt with, who they'd robbed and who they'd claimed they'd robbed it from. Occasionally, Jonathan would need to dispose of one of his crooks. Perhaps they'd kept something back for him, or perhaps they were getting too big for their boots, or perhaps he just didn't like the look of them anymore. It happens. And when it did, Jonathan would put a little X by the crime he'd have them tried for. Once the judge and the hangman had done their job, Jonathan would return to his book and add another little X, from whence we get the term to double-cross someone. By the end of his life, there were no less than 67 double crosses in the book. In 15 years, Jonathan had grown from petty criminal to the undisputed underworld boss, but his empire was getting out of control. Both the legal and the criminal world were getting fed up with the outrageous Mr Wilde, his lost property shop and his nasty little book of crosses. One man that Jonathan tried to double-cross went by the ludicrous name of Blue Skin Blake. Write that down, ladies and gentlemen. Blue Skin Blake. Anyway, old Blue Skin wasn't happy. Certainly wasn't happy about the idea of being double-crossed. What do you got for me, then? I won't touch it. Blue Skin had worked for Wilde for many a year, but was now surplus to requirements in a waiting trial at the Old Bailey. When Wilde turned up to give evidence, Blue Skin saw the chance for revenge. Unfortunately, the knife wasn't sharp enough and Wilde survived. I'm not surprised people hated him. I do, and I haven't even met him. And I won't at this rate. Oi, Lurch! What's happening? Am I going to have to sleep here all night? I'm afraid Mr Wilde has been detained, sir. Det what do you mean, detained? Well... And I'm Mrs Kathleen Strathairn. It all started in January 1725, when, for some strange reason, Jonathan did something he'd always tried to avoid, getting two of his cronies, Margaret Murphy and Henry Kelly, to rob a linen shop owned by one Kathleen Stratham. Jonathan decided to take part, acting as watchman for the raid. The man who never liked to get his hands dirty was now very grubby indeed. 
About the same time, one of Wilde's closest lieutenants, Roger Johnson, the captain of Wilde's ship, was arrested, caught with a dodgy cargo. Jonathan immediately raised a gang of thugs and had him sprung from an inn where the local constable was holding him. Normally, the magistrates would have turned a blind eye to this sort of thing. After all, Jonathan had kept their gibbets busy for many a year. But now, he was becoming a liability. His flouting of the law was just a bit too public. And as a result, he was arrested on the 15th of February, 1725, for springing Johnson. Then it all came tumbling down. Half the criminals in London wanting to shop him. The magistrates ended up with no less than 11 capital charges that they could have topped him on. But in the end, they chose the raid on the shop of Mrs Kathleen Stratham. The thief taker general brought down by £50 worth of lace and cloth. That means nothing, that's just a bit of cloth. I've purged this town. Look at the criminals I've brought to justice. Look at them. Look at the list. As a last resort, Wilde called the judge's attention to his record as a public servant and man of the law. He made a great show of his success rate in bringing evil felons to the gallows, which was a bit ironic. Look at that one. There's another. John Levy of the Strand in 1719. John Fair. It was all to no avail, with over 200 other categories on the statute books to choose from. It was inevitable that Jonathan got the death penalty. Wilde had been the gangland boss of London for 15 years. He was such a figure of hate that when he finally went to the gallows, the crowd, normally quite generous and forgiving of the condemned man, actually tried to kill him before he was executed. He was hanged on the 24th of May, 1725. Indeed he was. Six o'clock this morning. Oddly, Jonathan Wilde is one of the rogues you can still meet today. You see, his body was used for dissection and his skull still remains in the Museum of the Royal College of Surgeons in London. Penny for your thoughts, Jonathan? Mike had a shilling and we got a deal. A tale of mutiny, murder and deceit tonight on Prime as the new series of Wrong continues at nine. And there's a very similar tale for Vic Reeves to deal with in the gallery next.